И така сега дам думата на нашия гост от Естония, който беше тук, но изчезна. Тамет, професор Тамет от Естония, който ще ни разкаже за тяхното интернет гласуване и някаква критична оценка също ще научим и как то ще се развива в бъдеще. Десет години интернет гласуване в Естония. I'm very happy to be here and, and, uh, and learn a lot about the democracy issues. Now, my own background is, uh, is somewhat connected. I'm one of the founders of the Green Party and I've been promoting direct democracy ideas and uh, I kind of let all fade, so I, I, I left the party for some time ago. And, uh, and I have been active in the, in the Estonian internet election project from the beginning, not doing any, any um, hired work, but doing analysis and organizing uh, crowdsourced auditing and things like that. Let me learn the buttons. Okay, here's the short abstract. So we started uh, internet elections in Estonia 10 years ago and actually Estonia is the only country in the world who is doing really uh, wide-scale internet elections for the period and for the good reason other countries are not doing that is normally considered to be a very dangerous thing and, and really hard to make secure and I'm not saying in the Estonian cases so super secure, but there are arguments why we are going to continue that and we think it's, it's not good enough so far. Um, now first some obligatory touristic pictures about where Estonia is and how does it look like. So we, we are slightly larger than Iceland and not so much the north. <laughs> Uh, the old town of Tallinn looks like this. It's very well preserved and it's a good town. And uh, uh, we don't have snow in May, but we do have in January or February. It's the town hall. I'm not very good with these buttons. Now, the IT security field in Estonia uh, has been. I'd say overrepresented in the whole IT area from the beginning of uh, 1990s and, uh, and it has become kind of a uh, national object of national pride almost at least amongst the IT specialists. So we have now IT security master programs at our university and some other universities so it's very important. So this is one of the backgrounds why we have the elections that people think that, uh, that, yeah, we can do that, and we are proud to do that, basically. Now, I, I want to stress that what I am speaking about now is, is voting over internet, not voting by machines. Voting using the voting machines is, uh, is also called e-voting. Sometimes people use different letters there, but not always. And, uh, and uh, the voting machines are also pretty controversial. As you know, the default controversies of various clients. We are not using the voting machines. We are using the internet, and the internet is actually even worse. Now, the, the ways, the principal ways you can do voting over internet, it's not just one. There are quite several different uh, principal architectures you could take and, and the Estonian one is, is very simple, it's based on the traditional snail mail or paper mail voting where you have two envelopes and in the outside envelope you put uh, your personal details so that the uh, voting team can then later verify that you are really eligible to vote and inside there is a closed envelope without your personal information which contains the vote so the idea is simple, uh, eventually your inside envelope is taken out of the outside, is thrown into a separate box, 
and 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 after that, it's, there is no way to to check who voted how. And, and this is, of course, absolutely crucial because otherwise the votes would be anonymous, right? And, uh, and this is also a source of, uh, of uh, unverifiability since uh, there is no paper trade, there is no electronic trade. After, after we have separated the internal votes from the external votes, we cannot verify what really happened. And it's very different from internet banking where, where you have concrete trace of every step, you can basically go and very by every step what has been happening. And you cannot do that in, in internet voting. So so this is in a way much harder. Uh, the buttons, the buttons. <laughs> okay, so in the electronic case, the principle is the same. We have the internet uh, voting application in the user's computer, and it could also be mobile phone, actually. Uh, from about four or five years ago, we can also vote by mobile phone. And, uh, uh, and the external message contains your personal data, it is signed electronically and the internal message is this encrypted vote which doesn't contain your personal data and, and now all this encryption and signing thing is of course really important so one reason we, we have been doing the internet elections rather happily is that we have a statewide infrastructure of electronic signatures and encryption uh, so we don't need to distribute any kinds of passwords or ID specifically for the elections. We have the, the electronic ID cards already and they are very actively used all the time by people. So they look like this, ordinary ID cards, just that you, you can, you can uh, put your official, completely official uh, electronic signature in any document. You can also encrypt to that and authenticate that and contains a contains chip for doing this. And uh, we can also do this over phone because we have the special SIM cards where you can do the encryption and you can also do electronic signatures. So as said before, what happens when the server gets the votes is that uh, the internal uh, envelopes or messages are taken out and put to a separate part and they are not decrypted initially and they are decrypted later by using a key shared by several people plus some, plus some hardware tokens. So the central system contains several parts, contains, saves all messages, checks that voter is eligible, does logs, whatever, and then importantly stores separately these internal envelopes which are finally decrypted by a group of people and counted. And so it isn't very trivial, it's not very complex either, but it's not totally trivial because it has to contain many parts. And there's also this separate voter application and we have recently developed an application by which a user can actually verify that the server stored her vote properly. And this can be done anonymously so that the uh, internal envelope is not open, but the actual person who voted can still verify that the vote was stored properly. And eventually, when the votes have been counted, then all this uh, hardware is destroyed. So basically, the team leader of the, of, the, of the voting team takes a hammer and smashes everything publicly so that everybody can see it's a nice and funny sight. These are the actual remnants of the disks. So, to compare the Estonian elections, there are two other countries who have seriously been doing uh, parliament elections electronically, and these are Norway and Switzerland. And now Norway has had two legally binding uh, test cases which weren't, which weren't uh, uh, for the whole country, just a part of the population, but 
insignificant part, and the tests were finally cancelled. So that uh, the government said that, okay, it kind of worked, but no, we're not very interested. It doesn't give us much. And there is some controversy around that. It's kind of dangerous. And it actually is kind of dangerous. And uh, I, I looked at the presentations by the people who audited this software, and they, their basic problem was that the software was huge, complex, and very hard to audit, very hard to read. We haven't found anything really bad. We have found lots of small bad things. But overall, it's like a huge enterprise software. Maybe you should rewrite it. And so what happened on the other side was the government changed, and the new government wasn't interested. And so they used this uh, complexity of the system to say that it's, uh, it's a bit controversial, which is kind of true. Now, Switzerland has been moving in the same direction, but very, very slowly for a long time. And their approach basically is do it by canton by canton, since uh, they have, as you know, very uh, independent cantons. So three cantons have been developing their own systems, completely different from the other ones, and, uh, and they have been moving slowly. And the focus is on, on letting the uh, Swiss people living abroad to vote, which is, which is very understandable. So otherwise they do by May, which is also an important factor in the Swiss case that voting by ordinary paper mail is extremely common. And most of the referendums they do all the time, they do by paper mail. So that uh, going over to the electronic system is not so big a step actually. Mm. Now, now coming to these danger issues and the ways to mitigate these, and there are several kinds. So the first group, I would say, is completely non-technical. It's, uh, it's what everybody thinks about this, what, what danger is, and it's completely true. First, uh, you could say that, okay, if, uh, if you can vote electronically, then perhaps this uh, uh, spectrum of who actually votes changes a bit. So people who didn't vote before maybe start voting because it's, it's easier to vote for them. And, uh, and this is true, and of course, on the other hand, the problem is slowly mitigated since uh, over time, practically everybody becomes uh, uh, all the time internet user. So it wasn't so maybe 10 years ago, but it's kind of almost so now, and it's certainly so 10 years from now. So this is a problem which just goes away itself. Uh, and the second problem, of course, is that the voting is not uh, not completely hidden anymore. You don't go to a voting booth, you could vote from home, and that means the other guys could look over your shoulder and just tell you vote like that or else. And, uh, and this is a problem. And so, what same problem, of course, with the mail voting. What we have been doing is we, uh, we have changed the legislation immediately when this uh, project started for the e-voting so that we can vote many times. And now I'm, I'm giving a short overview of statistics, what has been happening. So as you see, we have been doing electronic voting in all the elections from 2005. Initially, very small turnout, obviously. And now it's about 30%, which is, I would say, about too high. It's, it's really kind of dangerous. If it were my choice, I'd bring it down to about like 20 or, or, or less. Because the initiative for, for doing uh, hacks or frauds or, or whatever kinds of manipulations is getting kind of high here. Now, the question about whether younger people say, or more technologically adept people who start voting more. Uh, what you see from this picture is that it initially definitely was the case, younger people voted more, but, but in 10 years basically this gap has disappeared. So, so now we could say like the uh, internet voting is rather, has the same age distribution as ordinary voting. Not exactly, but it's, it's very close. And, and the similar effect to the gender difference, as we know, typically young males like to the experiment of gadgets more than girls. 
and initially, initially it definitely was the case that there were a bit more mains loading, but now it's vice versa. Now it has been like it's 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 really representative of the ordinary voter. So slightly more females as there are slightly more female voters overall. Okay, now about the neutrality, the very clear, obvious reason why government wanted to introduce uh, internet elections was that they estimated that they would, they would get a bit more votes by that, since uh, the government at that time um, had most support by, by younger and, uh, and more technologically adept people, I would say. And the main opposition forces uh, had more support from, uh, from older people, rural areas, etc. And now, by the way, this has never changed. Although the governments have changed and we have had several elections, etc., but overall the, the dominating forces so far have been the same people who, who, uh, who get more support from somewhat younger people. It's, uh, it's not a very strong difference, but it's there, so that they have clear political motivation to continue that. On the other hand, it's unclear how strong this bias is. Originally, in the first voting, when we had very few voters, like just 2 3 percent, it was very clear it was a strong bias towards the ruling government, but it has mostly like melted. So, so the slide here first says that has the um, turnout changed? And the second part of the slide speaks about the neutrality. And the, the turnout we have estimated and measured for the, not for the last elections this year, but uh, the previous ones, the estimates are that the uh, internet elections gave two to three percent more turnout. So, so it is positive, but not like a shattering effect. And maybe it's getting slower, lower, we don't know. We don't really know. Uh, as for neutrality, it is, uh, it is very controversial. Some studies say that uh, the initial bias towards the, the uh, governing uh, parties has disappeared, and some studies say they haven't completely disappeared, but they have become relatively small. And it seems to be likely that it's still there, but it's not very strong. And in that respect, the intense interest of the, of the, of the government towards doing that is not so intense, and the intense anger of the opposition is not so intense. They, they, they are kind of used to that. They think that, okay, there are no drastic defects. We shouldn't bother so much. So as I said, the political neutrality is unclear, and the researchers from research that say ambiguous things about this. They kind of say it's there, and it's not there, and then nobody really knows. Now, I said before that uh, to combat coercion, that somebody forces you to vote, we, uh, we have introduced originally, even when the project started, a change in the law that you can vote electronically as many times as you like. And every new vote just uh, uh, notifies the last one. And you can also vote physically, and the physical vote dominates the electronic vote. And you can do this, all of this, only in the, in the uh, pre-election phase, which takes seven days. And after that, there is a pause, three to four days before the final election day. So that in this pre-election, you can do electronic voting and changing that, and not afterwards. Now, there are many potential potential attacks and defense on the technological side, they are well known. I'm not going into these, just that these, uh, these are a constant issue for the security experts. Uh, and I would say, and I think we, we mostly agree in Estonia, that the main danger comes from the potential insider attacks, which is much harder to mitigate. And I'd say that the main reason we, we, we think that the insider attacks are, 
not very broad. But right now is that there is an almost lot of personal trust and pride involved in this committee. So the country is small and that means also that the security experts know each other. And then say, for example, my own personal trust in the election really is based on the fact that they know these guys. And of course it means that, that if the committee is completely changed, maybe I don't trust them anymore. So it's a very personal thing. On the other hand, it's very likely that I know the other guys too, because I know most of them, and they know each other. So this small community effect kind of protects that. So uh, has positive and has negative sides. Uh, now, the main opposition party has been clearly against the voting from the very beginning. And say 2013, they launched even an outdoor campaign, a large campaign all over the main cities, saying that the e voting is or might be manipulated in various ways. And you shouldn't e vote, and you should not ban that. And this is an example of this outdoor campaign. And they had several, several messages like that, saying, uh, saying what, what could happen and that overall it's, uh, it's a serious danger to the Estonian independence because uh, the outer powers could uh, corrupt people or hack into the system and do something. Now worldwide, the security experts are normally, I'd say 90% against the evil, saying completely correctly that uh, since there is no trade so we can't have the trade because of the anonymity reasons. It's inherently insecure and it cannot be made totally secure. And, and we have had several very nice analysis of all kinds of problems there are, smaller and larger ones. And they are in a way completely right. Now, Estonian security experts know all of this and still tend to trust the system. For these reasons, I would say, first, the ID card infrastructure we have is fairly unique that it's so commonly used that we can totally uh, base our system on that. So it's the main medium you use for logging into banks. Banks have basically just dropped their passwords altogether. You cannot really use the Estonian internet banks without the ID card, mostly, except maybe some very weird exceptions. You have to electronically sign it, so, so that this infrastructure is working all the time. And the second part is that the experts know each other, which is not a, not a, a significant part of trust. And finally, we estimate that the amount of money flowing in the election system, although not small in a way, is still very, very small when you compare it to any kind of larger country. And, and hence, it might be that, or it looks like that, that it's not so lucrative to try to uh, corrupt the election team members because the total amount of money is not so big. I'd say that if the country were ten times bigger, the chances of corruption would also be like ten times bigger. The overall money is just larger. And the team is still very small. Because the main danger is that the the internet election is extremely centralized and totally relies on this central service, whatever you do. Now the three factors of the public trust, I'd say, first and foremost is the Estonian e-patriotism. It's kind of like the matter of national pride to do something fancy with the internet and computers. And, and this is definitely one of the five things, so we're all very proud of that. Uh, now the ruling coalition has said supports e voting because it thinks correctly that it gains something from that. Not very much though, but something at least. Used to gain more, but now when it's already moving the momentum, we don't want to turn it back. And, and finally, the significant percentage of, uh, I'd say, majority perhaps now, still, of the leading Estonian IT experts support it for the reasons we had before. Uh, I'm skipping some first guidelines, uh, I was the author of one of them, and the important issue here is that uh, initially from the project start we tried to engage a large percentage of important IT security specialists in Estonia. So they weren't really like bought up, but they were involved in their project 
they were participating in writing the guidelines, they got some money for that, they, they had personal attachment. And that made it very hard for them to criticize the thing because they, they kind of were attached to this, right? Now this attachment has been dissolving slowly and the other people have been coming up who are not really attached to that. So that it's not anymore so homogeneously supported, I would say. So that's a danger. Now I have a summary here, the lessons learned. Now I'd say that to start with the internet elections, because they are so controversial, you must have something special like the Estonian ID card thing, or the Swiss long tradition of snail mail voting. I mean, uh, something like that. And, and probably in the Norwegian case, it wasn't so strong, so they, it was easy to cancel. They didn't feel like attached to that. Now, some parties are inevitably opposed to the thing. That's completely sure. They, they are coming up with a completely valid arguments against that. So you have to be prepared to uh, to kind of work with this. Now the e-voting, as we have seen, improves the e-voting turnout by 23% so far. Not very much, but somewhat. And the political neutrality is unclear. It's uh, probably not completely neutral, but the effects are, are in Estonian case not very strong either. They are stronger actually in local elections. And, and less strong in the parliament elections, I'd say. In the local elections, they are really important. And, and also the opposition parties have been very intense against the e-elections in the local elections. Now, some form of public auditing is a must. If you don't do that, people will just say, ah, oh, we, we don't really trust that. And, and, and that's right. And in the Estonian case, we didn't do public auditing first. It was just higher auditing. And, uh, and eventually, when the opposition parties became fairly strong with their criticism, then, then I managed to organize public auditing, which the com electoral committee didn't initially like to do. They didn't want to give out the source code uh, completely free and without the NDA. But now they do, so that everybody can go and, and look at the source code without any NDA. It's just a bit hard. Uh, now, as you saw, the external skepticism is not the blogger. It's, uh, it's like totally standard. Most of the security experts worldwide will say it's very dangerous. They are completely right. Still, it's not a blogger. Uh, but you must have a positive attitude of local IT specialists. If you don't have that, that would be a problem. So if the local IT specialists say it's fine for several reasons, then, then this, uh, this carries more weight than the external specialists carry, actually. Uh, and looking at the wider picture, we see that the overall the election process drifts more towards pre-election. We now have like, I think about 50% of votes cast altogether are in pre-election phase. And uh, all these 30% of the votes, uh, the, the electronic votes, they are all in the pre-elections so that the whole election process is prolonged and it's not like focused on the one day anymore. And finally I would say that although we, we could think or hope, so as I personally initially hoped that having successful electronic elections would move us towards uh, direct democracy, we could say that to have these processes we can easily do elections, etc. etc. I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening at all. So, uh, uh, in the sense of direct democracy, all this electronic election thing seems to be neutral. It isn't against that, but it doesn't help. And uh, actually, when you do the uh, e-voting, you, of course you have ordinary voting, and the e-voting procedure is fairly complicated, completely non-trivial, and uh, it doesn't look like you can, for example, take this software and this process and use it in ordinary small elections at the university, for example. It's not really geared for that. It's too heavy. It uh, relies too much on the processes which are not trivial. Okay. Uh, we, with this pessimistic note, I'm finished. Thank you. <laughs>